order. Questions to the Secretary of State for International Development. Thangham Debonair. Question number one, Mr Speaker. The Secretary of State for International Development, Secretary Alok Sharma. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. DFID is investing in migrant source countries to give people better opportunities to build a decent life at home. Over the past four years, support for UK aid across all programmes has enabled 14 million children to gain a decent education, and almost 52 million people have got access to clean water and better sanitation. Thank you, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Secretary of State for that answer. But refugee resettlement is one way that allows people to get a safe and legal route to a safe country if they are classified as refugees by the United Nations. And I know DFID funds and supports this, but there's no commitment to long-term resettlement programmes. So will the Secretary of State consider committing to a minimum of 10,000 refugees per year via resettlement and for a minimum of five years? Um, Mr Speaker, I thank the Honourable Lady for her, her question. Um, she will know that in every year since 2016, uh, the UK resettled more refugees from outside Europe than any other EU member state, and I want to pay tribute to uh, the local authorities that have already settled 16,000 refugees uh, from, from Syria. Um, she will also know that uh, by 2020 we have the intention to rese resettle 20,000 Syrian refugees and additionally up to 3,000 vulnerable children and their carers, and post-2020, uh, under our, our, our new compact, Global Resettlement Scheme plans are there to resettle 5,000 of the most vulnerable every year. Alistair Burt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I uh, welcome my right honourable friend to what I think is his first questions uh, as Secretary of State for International Development and wish him, uh, as we would all do, very well in the role. Uh, could I ask him to update the House on the, uh, the quality of our safety support and solutions programme, a £75 million programme particularly used in Africa and North Africa on the migration route. A particular feature of that was being able to return those who had escaped the clutches of traffickers to go back to their home areas to warn others that that route out was so dangerous and so damaging. I'd be grateful for an update for the House. Uh, th thank you, Mr Speaker. May I also pay uh, tribute to the fantastic work that my Rodman friend did uh, in, in this role, uh, in, in this department. Uh, uh, he was an absolute champion for, for, for DFID. Um, he uh, talks about the, the programme, the Safety, Support and Solutions Phase 2 programme uh, that is uh, running. We are delivering humanitarian protection to vulnerable migrants uh, en route, uh, plus informing people about the living conditions and other risks, as he points out, that they may face if they travel through the Sahel or the Horn of Africa. In terms of numbers, I can tell him that one of our partners, the International Organisation for Migration, has reached over 4,000 people with awareness-raising activities. Mr. Morden. Mr. Speaker, global food insecurity is obviously a major factor in mass migration. Can the Minister provide an update on what his department is doing with aid agencies on the merits of integrating nutrition <coughs> into all areas of work? Yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah. Well, Mr. Speaker, we, we are working uh, across uh, a range of multilateral uh, agencies when it comes to nutrition, and she raises an incredibly important point, and those are discussions that my ministerial colleagues and I continue to have. Uh, but I would just also point her to uh, an announcement at the UN General Assembly that was made, uh, where £61 million has been announced to develop crops which are better adept, adapted to grow in higher temperatures and which can withstand droughts. I think this is the sort of work that will make a long-term difference when it comes to food insecurity. Yes, well, uh, well, friend, update the House on the situation with the Rohingya, what discussions he's had with the UNHCR on them and the government in Dhaka uh, about the situation in Cox's Bazaar. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, uh, my right honourable friend, of course, uh, as Minister Frazier, did an enormous amount of work in this area, and again, I pay tribute to him. Uh, he will know that the major humanitarian crisis is caused by Myanmar's uh, military. Uh, he will also know that we've recently announced an extra £87 million to provide support in terms of food, health care, shelter, uh, actually not just for the refugees, but also uh, support for uh, those who are hosting them. Uh, and currently, the uh, minister in the Lords is in Bangladesh uh, uh, looking at these issues. 
In northeast Nigeria, almost two million people are internally displaced. In a very disturbing development, the government of Nigeria has closed two major international non-governmental organisations, posing a risk to thousands of lives. Can I urge the Secretary of State to do all that he can to press the government of Nigeria to enable these NGOs to operate because they are about saving lives? Um, the Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. We are extremely concerned about this issue. We have raised it with the Nigerian Government and we are asking them to complete their investigations as swiftly as possible. And he's absolutely right. These organisations provide support to millions of people who are vulnerable and we must make sure that this work continues. Henry Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A fortnight ago I was privileged uh, to be in Jordan to see some of the remarkable work of small organisations uh, helping uh, child refugee migrants from the Syrian civil war recover from some, from some appalling uh, injuries. Uh, what further support can DFID particularly give towards those small NGOs who make such a positive difference? Good question. Well, Mr. Speaker, as Manuel Fon will know that we have uh, pledged uh, almost £3 billion pounds since 2012 in terms of providing support in Syria and the neighbouring areas. Uh, we are working with a range of NGOs, but I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss the individual NGOs that uh, he makes reference to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, yeah. Mr. Speaker, the inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has stated that the greatest single impact could be on human migration. By 2050, it's forecast up to 1 billion people in the world could be on a move as a result of climate change. And, and the International Development Select Committee recommended the UK use last week's UN Climate Summit to address this. Therefore, can the Secretary of State tell us specifically what discussions he's had on this subject and what concrete actions will his department be taking forward? Well, Mr. Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman will and actually he raises a very important point. Uh, there are a number of uh, key announcements that the Prime Minister made at the UN General Assembly, uh, the key one being the, the doubling of our investment and commitment to the International Climate Finance uh, uh, Fund, and this is something that we will work on, uh, but he is right that this is a key issue, and the way to tackle poverty is also to tackle climate change. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The world is on course to have 200 million climate refugees by 2050. So, can the Secretary of State tell us why his government continues to be part of the problem by funding fossil fuel expansion overseas by both the ODA budget and export finance? And if he wants to be part of the solution, will he commit to work with Cabinet colleagues to increase the number of refugee settlements in the UK as recommended by the UNHCR? Yeah. Um, Mr. Speaker, I would just say gently to the Honourable Lady that um, we are actually regarded as world leading when it comes to tackling climate change. Yeah. If she had been at the UN General Assembly, she would have seen this. Um, a whole range of announcements were made at the UN General Assembly. I would just say to her that I'm always very happy to have a discussion with her, but I think she should acknowledge that the UK is actually leading in this particular area across the world, and that is acknowledged by governments across the world too. Yeah. Peter Bottomley. Number two, sir. Yeah. <coughs> Mr Speaker, the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela is absolutely dire, with millions fleeing the Maduro regime. Last week, I announced an additional £30 million of vital humanitarian aid to deliver life-saving medicines and clean water, as well as support for vital health services for refugees in neighbouring countries. Mr. Peter Bottomley. I think everyone will be glad that we are doing what we can to help. Would it be a good idea? if the party leaders together nominated members of the Youth Parliament to go and see what has caused this social, economic, humanitarian and political crisis in a country which should be the richest in its continent. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, my, my honourable friend raised a very important point. Inflation is running at over 1 million percent in Venezuela. Uh, poverty has doubled. Uh, and I would just say to uh, the party opposite, that of course this is the economic model and regime that the Leader of the Opposition has been defending over a long period of time. And, and, and again, I think uh, you know, people watching will know that Venezuela does serve as a grim reminder of what might happen to the economy of our country and indeed the aid budget should the party opposite ever get their hands near government. Yeah. Welcome the invocation of the United Kingdom Youth Parliament, which I say for the benefit of observers customarily holds its sitting in the chamber on a non-sitting Friday annually and is due to take place again next month. A magnificent organisation which deserves the support of every one of us. Lloyd Russell Moyle. 
Uh, until the Venezuelan government was destabilised, HIV treatment was um, successful and death to AIDS was decreasing. Since the destabilisation, HIV treatment is almost impossible for many people in Venezuela now, and the healthcare system has collapsed. What is the government doing particularly to ensure antivirals are reaching HIV-positive people in Venezuela? Mr. Mr. Speaker, the reason the healthcare system and indeed public services have collapsed is because of the Maduro regime, and that is something we have to acknowledge. Um, but as I said, as I said uh, the, the, the support that we're providing does indeed include uh, uh, healthcare support, and it is the case that actually there has been a big increase in these disease outbreaks uh, over recent periods, and that's why we're providing support for healthcare and vaccinations. Is the UK government giving to the UN Central Emergency Response Fund, and how much is that fund giving to the Venezuelan crisis? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, we have given uh, about uh, two million pounds of support to the International Federation of the Red Cross and Red Crescent, and in turn, national societies. In terms of additional funds that we've made available, we don't discuss the value of programmes inside Venezuela or indeed name partners for security reasons. And I hope you'll understand that. Uh, given the extent of the problem and the millions of people fleeing Venezuela and the amount that the Minister has alluded to, what steps are we taking to ensure that that aid is offered directly to people affected and isn't diverted by the regime? I think uh, the Honourable Gentleman raises a very important point. And, Mr Speaker, we have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to fraud and we do have robust controls against diversion. I can tell him that we have due diligence assessments in place to monitor the spending in Venezuela. Angela Crawley. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker, I would like to understand the Government's staff. Question three. Sorry, question three. Minister Zach Goldsmith. Um, with, with permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll answer this with question number four. Climate change and biodiversity were top priorities for the government at the recent UN General Assembly. And the UK played a leading role, with the Prime Minister announcing a doubling of our international climate finance to £11.6 billion and a major focus on backing nature based solutions to climate change. Crawley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would like to understand, first of all, um, the International Development Committee has specifically recommended that the UK government adopt the concept of climate justice to guide the climate spending. Yet this government seems either scared to even utter the words, or not a single international development minister has ever said the words climate justice in this chamber. Now, Mr. Speaker, why is this government so intent on ignoring this recommendation? I thank the Honourable Member for her question. But given what we know about the science in relation to climate change, and given what we know about what is happening to biodiversity, habitat and species loss, it is absolutely right that this government's focus has to be on tackling and preventing climate change, both with technology and by doing everything we can to protect and restore the natural world. If we don't do that, then no amount of money from this aid department or any other aid department is going to properly compensate poorer countries for the devastation that would follow. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I'm afraid the Minister failed entirely to answer I my Honourable Friend's question. Will he tell the House when he'll follow Scotland's lead and the recommendation of the International Development Com uh, Committee? When will he explicitly adopt this concept of climate justice to help climate, uh, yeah, guide yeah, yeah. climate mitigation yeah, 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 yeah. I, I thank her for a question, and I, I, but I disagree that I didn't answer it. We, we provide a 5.8 billion for climate finance at the moment. That is doubling to 11.6, at least 11.6. The whole basis of that programme, in a sense, is climate justice. It's about helping developing countries prepare for climate change, adapt to the changes that are inevitable, and fight the causes of climate change to minimise the impact. By 2030, the destruction of the world's important habitat and the threat of climate change could force more than 100 million people into poverty. Does my honourable friend agree that urgent action is needed to tackle deforestation throughout the world? Minister. I thank her for her question and, and commend her for all her work on this issue. She's absolutely right, and that is why when the Prime Minister spoke at the UN, he emphasised the importance of investing in nature as a means of tackling climate change. She mentions forests, and that's an obvious example. About a billion people depend on forests for their survival. Therefore, protecting and restoring forests not only alleviates poverty, it tackles climate change, and it helps reverse the biodiversity loss that we've seen in recent years. Can I first of all welcome my honourable friend to his uh, well-deserved place in the stretch box? The environmental world rejoices that he is there, and I know he'll do an absolutely outstandingly good job, so welcome to him. 
Um, does he agree with me that it's a perfectly legitimate use of aid funds to spend money uh, on uh, climate change reduction, uh, climate change battling, but also uh, mitigation of the worst effects of climate change? That helps not only the globe, of course, but it also helps the worst effects uh, on, on the poorest of the people in the world. I, I thank him for his, his kind words, and he is exactly right that we will have no hope at all of tackling poverty globally if we don't take a bigger interest in preventing climate change and also preventing the annihilation of the natural world that we have seen in recent decades. The people on the front line in relation to nature destruction are the world's poorest people. Those are the people who depend most directly on the natural world. So he's absolutely right. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I welcome the Minister to his post. I'm sure he will agree with me that the food and farming system has a major impact on the climate change in developing countries, um, from deforestation to water use to mountains of food waste. But it's not really talked about in different terms except with some uh, sort of small livestock programmes. Can he assure me that it will be put at the top of his agenda mm. as a minister in this department? Yes. Um, I thank her very much for her question. Uh, the, as we heard from the Secretary of State in his first answer, we have committed serious sums of money to enabling small holders around the world to adapt to climate change. But we also launched an initiative at the the UN uh, called the Just Rural Transition, which is about shifting the way subsidies are spent around the world on land use, away from unsustainable use towards sustainable use, just as we're doing in this country. The OECD tells us that the 50 top food producing nations spend £700 billion a year subsidising land use, on the whole very badly. If we can shift even a fraction of that, it will have a much bigger impact than all of the world's aid departments put together. Very well done. Very nice. Question number five, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, DFID's support for the She Trades Commonwealth Programme has trained 2,700 women owned businesses. Uh, we recently announced £30 million for the Affirmative Finance Action for Women in Africa programme, which will help to unlock £3 billion of additional lending to women entrepreneurs. Some of the most inspirational, determined business leaders and entrepreneurs in Romsey and Southampton North are women. Can I ask my set, on, right honourable friend, the Secretary of State, whether he and his front bench team agree that female empowerment cannot begin and end in school, it also has to continue into the workplace, and whether he will commit to giving more support to make sure that we have women business leaders in the developing world? Well, uh, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. Uh, economic empowerment for, for women is absolutely vital. And I, I made mention of the Affirmative Finance Programme. This is tackling uh, issues such as access to finance, access to mentoring support, and overcoming laws which discriminate against women. It's worth pointing out, Mr. Speaker, that women typically reinvest up to 90% of their income in education, health, and nutrition, compared to 40% for men, meaning that investing in female led businesses can transform societies. Rachel Maskell. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Specialist organisations like Quendo Core are delivering services to women are being restricted by other NGOs and consorted by exclusivity, exclusivity causes so that they only can bid for one, with one organisation for funding. This means that expertise is being lost. So can the Secretary of State ensure that exclusivity, exclusivity causes are removed? Well, Mr Speaker, I'd be very happy to meet we are very happy to meet the Honourable Lady to discuss this particular case and to just try and understand a bit better what we could do. And Maine. Much, Mr. Speaker. Menstruation stops many women participating in the business world, but also mostly affects the poorest, no more so than the Rohingya camps that Oxfam told me about. Wooker produces underwear that absolutely deals with this problem, is reusable, and is environmentally sustainable. Will his department meet with Wooker, Ruby Rao, and those others in St. Albans who developed this product to help women beat the problems of menstruation? Uh, Mr. Speaker, can I pay tribute to my honourable friend for all the work that she has done in Bangladesh in terms of tackling humanitarian issues? She raises a very important point. Uh, we have a flagship programme called the Girls' Education Challenge, which does fund support for 23 menstrual hygiene projects across 13 countries. But of course, I'll be very happy to meet with her and the company in her constituency. Malcolm McDonald. Grateful. I'm very grateful, Mr. Speaker. Ukraine is perhaps a country that is redeveloping rather than developing. Can the Secretary tell us? what projects he's supporting for women in business and education in the east of Ukraine, where there is a war with Russia, particularly through the International Committee of the Red Cross. Uh, Mr Speaker, I'm uh, not aware of the details of programmes that he talks about, but, be, but I would be very, happy, I'd be very happy to meet with him to discuss this particular case. But, uh, topical questions, Tim Lawton. Topical one, sir. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, governments around the world collectively spend around $140 billion every year on aid. However, the United Nations estimates that an additional $2.5 trillion is required annually in developing countries to meet the Sustainable Development Goals. This investment gap needs to be met largely by the private sector. That is why I have established an International Development Infrastructure Commission to advise the UK Government on how we can mobilise additional private sector funds alongside public money to deliver on the Sustainable Development Goals. Speaker, can I welcome the Secretary of State and the new Ministers to their post. Now, representing a coastal constituency, I'm only too well aware of the impact of pollution and plastic waste on marine life and our beaches. It was great to join many of my constituents at the recent Great British Beach Clean. But given that much of the plastic problem affects developing countries, especially island nations, how is the Government using the aid budget to help clear up our oceans? Well, Mr Speaker, my honourable friend raises an incredibly vital point. Uh, he may be aware that the Prime Minister announced at the UN General Assembly uh, earlier this, uh, well, last month that we are encouraging countries to join the UK-led Global Ocean Alliance of countries in support of protecting at least 30% of the global oceans within marine protected areas by 2030. Pardon. The Secretary of State has announced a new commission of business and finance leaders to mobilise private finance to invest in some of the world's poorest countries. What action is he taking to guarantee that all aid-backed private investments uphold labour rights and living wages for workers in the Global South? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, Mr Speaker, I, I think that's a sort of welcome for the Infrastructure Commission that we've set up. Uh, but he's absolutely right. Labour rights are absolutely vital. Uh, when I was Minister for Employment, I worked with the ILO on, on these issues. And I would be very happy if he has particular suggestions to, uh, to discuss those with him. Dan Carden. He is failing to take labour rights seriously. He is a career investment banker by trade. And he has... Well, I think it's relevant. I think it's relevant that he's gone from corporate wealth management to managing the UK's aid budget. Mr Speaker, Feronia, a Canadian palm oil company based in the DRC, has received tens of millions of pounds of UK aid via the CDC group. It's been plagued by scandal for years, and in July, Joel Imbangola Lunia, a community activist involved in a land dispute with Feronia, was allegedly murdered by a security guard employed by the company. Joel was father to eight children. Order. 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 Can I just appeal to the honourable gentleman to get to his question mark? Because there are lots of colleagues who want to contribute, and they must do so. Dan Carden. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will his department now launch its own investigation into this case and the litany of failures surrounding Feronia? Uh, Mr. Speaker, he's very welcome to write to me on the case. What I would say to him is that he wrote an article a few uh, days back describing me as uh, exploring ways to profit from human uh, mystery. Can I just point out to him that, with respect, um, he perhaps could take some lessons from the chairman of the Select Committee, who knows a lot more about development than I think he does. Bruce. Fiona Bruce. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Many of my constituents are concerned about plastic pollution, and I recently attended the launch of Plastic Free Congleton. What is the UK Government doing to reduce and indeed stop plastic pollution in developing countries? Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I know my honourable friend, she's a true champion when it comes to tackling humanitarian and environmental matters. I made reference in my previous answer to plastics uh, and what we're doing, but I can also inform her that the UK Government has pledged £70 million to directly tackle this issue in developing countries through the provision of technical assistance and testing practical approaches to increase plastic recycling rates. Lynch. This month we are celebrating 25 years of fair trade in the UK. In this case, the fair the dispatch box. Will the Secretary of State reaffirm this government's commitment to fair trade and will they join me in celebrating with the Fair Trade Foundation on such a milestone achievement? Mr Speaker, uh, she will know that we run a range of projects uh, which are designed to ensure that we have fair trade uh, and of course I commend the work that goes on in this area. Maria Caulfield. Mr Speaker, uh, globally vaccines save 2.5 million lives every year. What discussions were had at the recent UN summit about the UK's role in the global vaccination programme? 
I'm very grateful to my honourable friend for, for raising this. She will know that the UK is the number one contributor to vaccines worldwide in the de- development space. She'll also know that the UK will be hosting Gavi replenishment next year. Furthermore, she will know that for every pound that is spent on vaccines, £21 uh, is recouped. It remains one of our best buys in terms of international development, and we made that very clear at under last week. Speller. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Minister will be aware of the devastating 2005 earthquake in Azad Kashmir with massive loss of life and damage to housing and infrastructure, and also the gratifying international response with assistance. Now, while the recent earthquakes were not on that same scale, they are still causing major major hardship. So can I ask the Minister what assistance is his department providing to the authorities there, both for emergency relief and for long-term reconstruction to help the long-suffering people of Azad Kashmir? Mr Speaker, as he knows, uh, we are a a major uh, aid donor to Pakistan overall. Uh, We are in uh, discussions with the National Disaster Management Authority in Pakistan, uh, and I can tell him that we stand ready to respond and provide funding if it is indeed requested. Pauline Latham. The economy in Zimbabwe is expected to contract by 5.2% this year, and millions are at risk of hunger, with warnings that the country is facing its worst ever famine. What are we doing to help? I thank my honourable friend for that question. Humanitarian needs are rising in Zimbabwe uh, due to a combination of poor and erratic uh, rains and the deteriorating economic situation. DFID have committed £49 million to a new Zimbabwe humanitarian and resilience programme, uh, but our ongoing re-engagement depends on fundamental political and economic reform in Zimbabwe. Green. Further to my honourable friend's question, will the government uh, press for the United Nations Group in India and Pakistan to make a fact-finding visit to Kashmir? to assess the humanitarian and human rights situation there. Uh, Mr Speaker, we obviously, uh, when it comes to Kashmir, have a long-stated uh, position which has been followed by successive governments. Uh, but, of course, uh, where there are re- uh, matters related to uh, humanitarian issues, we, of course, always look at those. The Honourable Gentleman Member for Slough was on the order paper for substantives but not reached, so I will call him on the strict understanding that he will be exemplary in his brevity. Mr Chairmanjeet Singh Desi. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Currently, approximately 97% of the UK's export financial support for energy uh, in developing countries goes to fossil fuels and only 1% for renewable energy. That is a ridiculous and untenable position given the government's own avowed aims. So what steps is the Secretary of State taking to ensure that his work in supporting developing countries to tackle climate change is not undermined by his colleagues in the Department for Trade? I thank the Honourable Member for his question. I'm pleased that the CDC has made no new investments at all in coal-fired power stations since 2012 and that increasingly UK ODA supports renewable energy. I'm assured that through its adoption of the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosure, UK Export Finance is looking very carefully at the risks he's just highlighted of its support for oil and gas. 